tied uh, in that uh, sinking as well. Uh, anyway, uh, go ahead. Interesting. Well, there's actually, did you mention that there's a, uh, the sort of a, I think that society, or very close to it, was, was a, uh, a branch of what was the Society British. for Psychical Research that was founded in Britain. Correct. The man who was the secretary of the SPR in London for almost 20 years was a fellow by the name of Everard Fielding, very close friend and follower of Aleister Crowley. Yeah, yeah. And in fact, if you read the book, you'll find out that the man who effectively was probably the fellow who recruited Crowley for British naval intelligence in 1914, who served throughout World War I for naval intelligence and MI6, and who was Crowley's basic case officer, was the same Everard Fielding. No kidding. Wow, what a Same cover. Guy. Interesting cover. Um, it connects back with something that I was mentioning just before the break about, you know, Crowley being connected to the OTO. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and the OTO is uh, the complex history there, but let's just say the OTO has its, its origins as a German occult organization. And the man who recruited Crowley into that uh, a couple of years before World War One, I, I think around 1912, was a, a fellow by the name of Theodore or Theodore Royce. And guess what? Theodore Royce, if you begin to look into his background, along with being a uh, sometimes singing waiter and, uh, <laughs> and journalist, was also a long-term German intelligence agent. <laughs> and that was what I figured out was part of a key component in Crowley's credibility with Germans in New York. And it's one of the things, you know, we tend to think of, of Crowley as being an occultist, but you know, the period of the First World War, uh, early 20th, late 19th century, is not any different than today. Uh, occult organizations, affiliations, interest in those things are widespread. Oh, um, enormously and, so. And what, what is... And, go ahead. Yes, and perhaps more so at the upper echelons of society, in government, uh, within intelligence agencies. And so Crowley is not, his, his occultism is not weird. He, he moves in a, no. in a world of which that's understandable, acceptable, mm -hmm. and that's what gives him credibility and influence. Mm -hmm. uh, and throughout his time in New York, Crowley is in direct communication with Theodore Royce, who at the same time is working, building German intelligence networks in Switzerland. Everybody was a spy back then. That, that, that was the era of uh, <laughs> human assets in intelligence. Now they yeah. use electronics and spies that are, uh, well, they're hardly in the field anymore. They control assets, everything from satellites to, to ground uh, relay networks and y you name it. It was different back then, and there were so many of them. Uh, what, uh, and double and triple spies, and uh, mm. just amazing. What a, what a, what a time. Well, a lot of them are fairly, you know, I ran into this in, in the research I was doing on Riley that I mentioned before. Um, Riley was, in every respect, a thoroughly disreputable character. Hmm. And uh, the British and others who employed him uh, didn't do it because they liked him or trusted him. Uh, mm -hmm. In fact, uh, in many cases, they feared him and deeply mistrusted him. But the answer as to why we should employ him, and I, much the same applies to Crowley. There were many people who had great reservations about this guy. Uh, you find people in the Foreign Office and elsewhere who say that, you know, we don't want to touch him. Uh, but others certainly did. And the reason why people were willing to work with him, uh, again, in some cases, in the case of Fielding, I think they would, there, there was a friendship there. There, there, were, there was a common bond in the cult beliefs and membership. But in other cases, it's for the simple fact the reason you employ any kind of human asset is that you don't employ them because they're nice people. You employ them because they're useful. And, again, Crowley's occultism, his connections and reputation were something that not everyone had. And he was someone who could gain access to circles and exercise influence there that other agents couldn't. And because of those unique characteristics... And, of course, the other thing is absolutely essential to this is a flexible personal morality. Uh, and he seems to have had that as, a as well. A flexible personal morality. I like that. Yes. That uh, Contextual morality, as it were. Yeah. Um, I mean, he could, he could justify doing these things. Um, All right. Well, let's you know, yeah, touch on a couple of the other highlights, if mm -hmm. you would, uh, Richard, in our remaining minutes. We've got about seven minutes left, and I want to kind of uh, tease people as much as we can about this fascinating book you put together. 
Well, there's all. Uh, Crowley spends um, a few other episodes in this. Uh, some people who know about Crowley's history may know that after World War One, he goes off and sort of starts his own kind of early 